Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception. Together today, we're in the book of Matthew. We're going to make a change. We've been doing Matthew in pretty much one half hour sessions. We're going to start to do an hour at a time of Matthew, and we're going to do half hour sessions on a different book of the Bible, and and we'll be bringing that to you soon. Just wanted to remind you, we're here at the webpage, and if you want to check out all of our Bible teachings right here on the homepage, you can just scroll down and click on Bible blog, and that's going to pop you right here, and you can see all the different books of the Bible that we have videos on out here on the website. They're all on BitChute, they're all on Gab TV. But for example, you click right here on the Gospel of Matthew, and it's going to take you to our Matthew page. And there's the, the last video that's up as of the time of this recording. And you can just go to the website and find all that stuff along with all the things we have out here under research and resources and the decoding videos that we do looking at events going on in the world. So today, we are here in Matthew. We're here in Matthew 24. And last time we did 24, 1 through 4. And the, and the big emphasis there, what we focused on was Jesus telling the disciples, because this is just Jesus, teaching the disciples. They're there on the Mount of Olives looking across at Jerusalem, and he's teaching the disciples. They come to him and ask him, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus answered, see that no one leads you astray. See that no one leads you astray. That is the big emphasis that Jesus puts on all of our questions. When, when we come to him with when, how long, all of these things that are legitimate questions, they're okay. It, it's natural that we have those questions, but it is so important to understand his number one concern is let no one lead you astray, and, and lead you astray is the one way it's translated. If you go and look, for example, at the NIV, it is See, watch out that no one deceives you. In the last video, I pointed out that that is the basis of the name of this channel, Decoding the Deception, because there's so much deception that comes. Satan seeks to deceive. He seeks to deceive. That is what he does. And, and you think, John 8, 44, what does it tell us? It tells us that he is the father of all lies and that all that he does is lie. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. Even when he speaks the truth, he can say something that's true. His intent with it is to trip you up, to deceive you, to lead you astray. The picture to keep in mind, shepherd. Sheep, wolf. The wolf wants to get at the sheep. And the only way the wolf is going to get at the sheep is if he gets the sheep, you and me, if he gets us away from the shepherd. He's got to get us far enough away from the shepherd so that he can get us, so that he can attack, so that he can destroy us so that he can hurt us. That is his aim. And it's all he does. It's all he does 24-7, 365, millennia after millennia after millennia. That is his aim and intention. And I said in the last video, you're playing chess, 18-dimensional chess. You're playing chess with someone who's been doing it for thousands of years, and he's beaten the best of the best. You don't stand a chance. I don't stand a chance against him. That's why I get all the closer to the shepherd, because the shepherd isn't going to allow 
anything to happen to me. I don't have to worry about being smart enough. I don't have to worry about being brave enough. I don't have to worry about being tough enough to deal with whatever Satan comes at me, what he brings to bear against me, as long as I'm right up against the shepherd. We have a German shepherd, and we have another dog, wonderful dog, two wonderful dogs, One's really brave, the German Shepherd. He literally doesn't know what fear is. It doesn't exist. The only thing that makes him upset is if he thinks I'm upset with him or mom's upset with him. Nothing else frightens him. The other dog, really sweet, not so brave. When we're out in a park and somewhere where there are other big dogs, guess what the smaller dog does? He presses right up against, he gets behind the shepherd. He knows. The shepherd's going to take care of me. Press in as close as you can, and you're all right. It's a wonderful picture of what we need to do. Stay close to the shepherd. We won't be deceived. If I'm there, and and how do I get close to the shepherd? I'm in the word. I'm in the word. It's through his word. That's his voice. The shepherd, Jesus says, the the sheep know the shepherd's voice, and they come to him. That's his word. That's his communication to me. And it is different than anything else. The more time you spend in God's word, the more you'll understand this. It is what Hebrews 4 tells us, that the word of God is living. It's active. It's not like anything else. The Lord speaks to you through it. Ask him in prayer, Lord, help me understand, teach me, and read. And then pause and pray some more. That is how he draws you close. It is how he makes you strong. It is how he makes you brave. It's how he makes you wise. It's how he gives you perspective so that you can identify the attacks of Satan. And a lot of this we're going to see in the text as we read it. The wolf isn't just, it isn't just that he has fangs and he's powerful and he can run fast. He's smart. He's smart. He needs to trick you into moving away from the shepherd. And and no one ever says, you know, when we talk about wandering from the faith, moving away from the shepherd, the sheep moving away from the shepherd, no sheep standing there with the shepherd says, you know what I think? I think that I'm just going to turn my back on the shepherd and I'm going to walk away and I'm going to go way over there, over that hill and that hill and through that valley. And I'm going to be down in there where I'm all alone. And there are lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. And they're going to come and the wolf and they're going to come and eat me up and destroy me. I think that's a good idea. I think that I'll do that. Nobody does that. No one has ever said, you know, I think that today I'm going to take my first step walking away from my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, become deceived, become lost, and end up in hellfire for all eternity. No one says that. It happens incrementally. We get deceived. And the word deceived, it, we'll talk about it more here in a minute, deceive, lead astray, it's a fascinating word, and we'll talk about it. We talked about it a little bit last time. We'll talk about it some more because it's so important. But we'll get into the text. For many will come in my name. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Every time you see astray, it's the same word. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. 
but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, said before, I want to make sure and repeat here, chapter 24, especially chapter 24 of the gospel of Matthew, Luke 13, Mark, I think it's 13 also, they are like the Cliffs Notes, for those who are old enough to remember Cliffs Notes, I don't know if they still do Cliffs Notes, the Cliffs Notes version of the book of Revelation. You get everything here. It's condensed, it's precise, it's specific, it's brief. Everything that's in the book of Revelation, pretty much, you've got right here. The book of Revelation expands. 22 chapters out of one chapter expands on all of this. So we see many of these things talked about in great detail repeatedly because Revelation talks about things from different perspectives again and again and again. We see it repeated and fleshed out in the book of Revelation. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Now, we've all seen, you know, the, the, the different cult leaders who come along and say, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm him. And, and they do have success. They do deceive people. And when you watch a documentary on them, you know, there's the guy over there in the Philippines now. They're, you know, the Jim Jones type thing in Guyana from, uh, from way, way, way back. You look at it and you say, how do these people fall for this? And... There's a personality type and things that people do fall for that. But I believe that that type of fulfillment of this is just one thing. Who says he's the Christ? Who says that he is Christ on earth? Well, that was a loud truck. Who says that he is that? What does the word vicar mean? It means in place of. Vicarious, everybody knows vicarious. We're not so familiar with the vicar. The Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ. He is in Christ's place here in this world. If you want to do damage, if you want to gut a company and destroy it, if you want to undo an empire and destroy it. And, and you have two options. You have two options. You can do it from the outside or you can do it from the inside. Which would you rather have? You take the inside in a position of power and authority from the inside. I can do whatever I want. I can mess things up. I can weaken defenses. I can manipulate everything. The greatest danger to the church, the greatest danger from believers comes from the inside. The greatest danger comes from the one and the ones. It's not just one because this applies to many. I'm talking about the papacy and the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that does damn to hell eternally. Anyone who says that I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone, in the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church damned to hell anyone who says that, and they've never taken it back. They've never taken it back. And that was all about the response to Martin Luther, okay? I am the Christ. I'm in the inside. A pastor. Who can, who can do more damage to the faith of the sheep? A pastor or a, a, a drug dealer? Well, the pastor, he's got people who trust him. He's got people who look up to him and respect him and believe what he says. So damage from the inside, far, far more destructive. From the inside, saying that, listen to me, I'll tell you the truth. And any time, and this isn't an extreme example, I'm not taking a small point and turning it into something big. If 
I'll back up and say it a different way. I've always told young people who are thinking about being servants in the church and ministering in the church, it is a terrible, fearful responsibility. Because when you are there and people are listening to you and they trust you, and you were saying, thus saith the Lord, this is what the Lord says about that. This is what the Lord says about this. They're coming to you and trusting you and looking for advice. If you steer them astray, it has devastating consequences. And when I look at the Word of God and say, yeah, I know that's what it says, but I'm going to teach this instead. Or if we just do that by not being as diligent as we should, then we're putting ourselves in Christ's place and we're speaking for him something that he doesn't say. In Jeremiah, woe to the prophets who say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord does not saith, they run and I didn't tell them to. They speak and I didn't put the words in their mouth. It's it's a great responsibility. So that danger from the inside, Paul and Luke, not yeah, Luke praised the Christians in Berea because what did they do? They took what Paul taught them and they went to the scriptures of the Old Testament and said, Yeah, that is what it says. He called them noble, the noble. Bereans, and you'll see Baptist churches do this. It'll be Berean Baptist Church. It's a good. It's a good name. The Bereans. They went to the scriptures to see if these things were so. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. It's bound to happen. Is really what it's saying. It's inevitable, but the end is not yet. How how do wars and rumors of wars undo people's faith? Let's make sure and make the connection. You know, right now, as I'm teaching this, we got the stuff going on in Ukraine. This video will be put out a few weeks later, probably just because the way the production goes. But, you know, let's go to something that everyone can identify with. The COVID-19 thing. Fear, panic, having everything you know turned on its ear or turned upside down, it's unsettling to people. And what the Lord knows is that at those times, some people, because they're afraid, they listen to other voices. Some people, because they're everything that they thought they knew seems to be undone, they question the truth that they've always known. And maybe they just didn't know that truth well enough, but times of famine, times of war, times of panic, times of upheaval, it, it, imagine that we'll use that word upheaval, like something lifts up, the ground underneath you moves, very unsettling, and it is as though it pushes some people away from the Lord, from the shepherd, takes some sheep and moves them away, and it takes others and moves them closer. We want to make sure and be the sheep who, when all the unsettling things come, those frightening things come, that we draw closer to him. And always remember, I don't want to give the impression that as believers, we don't get scared, that as believers, there aren't questions that we have, that things disturb us, and we're saying, why, why, why? All of those things are okay. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to wonder why, as long as we take those questions to the one who has the answers. And all of those questions come into focus. All of the things that could be our undoing, the undoing of our faith, they come into focus when we stand at the foot of the cross in our faith's eye. We stand at the foot of the cross and we look up at him, and there we see God himself bleeding and suffering, and dying for us. That's how much he loves me. I I can't comprehend that. I may not be able to comprehend some of the things that are going on in this world, but I know that he's got me. And then I look over to the tomb, the empty tomb that he walked out of, victorious over sin, victorious over death, victorious over hell and Satan, and I know I'm with him, and I want to stay as close 
as I can, because nation is going to rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but a beginning of the birth pains. Don't ever say it can't get any worse than this. Don't say those words because it can. Rather, say it might get worse than this. I need to be prepared. I need to draw closer to the Lord. Get right up close to him. And that flock of sheep that's all packed in around the shepherd, I want to be the one that's leaning on his leg. I want to be right there. Then they, they, they are the best friends of them. They and them. And they, and they, that, I, I say that is partly just in frivolity. In the, in the movie Conspiracy Theory, the, the guy, uh, Mel Gibson's character, says, they, them, you know, they're all part of the same dumb show. <laughs> they work together. They and them. They. They are the powers that be. They are the powers that be. And, and the, the they who we see in power are but the minions, the hand puppets of those who truly wield the power, the powers and principalities of the heavenly realm. They serve them. That's who we're up against. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Nowhere we have this ridiculous, and I don't know what else to call it, ridiculous notion that because I'm a believer, everything's good. I got it. I'm on easy street. God's going to provide Everything's going to be okay. My nation is going to be at peace. I'm going to have a job. I'm going to have money. I'm not going to be sick. The world isn't going to hate me and come after me and try to undo me just because I believe in Jesus. And that is all. Everything I just said it stands in complete contradistinction from what Jesus teaches us. He says, if they do this to me, what will they do to you? If they do it while the tree is green, what will they do when it's brown? In this world, you will have tribulation, John 16, 33. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Tribulation, that's what we get. Why? Because we're with them. We're with him. We're with Jesus. And, and we'll just look at the lives of all of those who followed him, all 12 of them. What happened to them? Every one of them, we have on good historical authority, only a few of them do we have reported in the scriptures, every one of them was killed except John. And John, as an old man, got dumped on a lousy island in the middle of the Aegean Sea and left. That's where he had, the Lord showed him his revelation. The book of Revelation comes from that. Things are going to be hard. Be ready for it. Be ready for it. If you think it's easy street and, and it turns out to be trouble and tribulation, you're set up just to fall. I didn't know this was going to be hard. Wait a minute. I didn't know I signed up for this. Yes, you did. And it's okay because he's got you. He's got you. You know, you, you can look at that picture of the sheep and the shepherd. Do you know why wolves eat sheep? Because that's what they do. You know why bears? kill sheep and eat them and drag them off because that's what they do. It's just the way it is. You know, the world has Disney-fied, Walt Disney-fied, the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom is a picture of what this world is. It's death. It's destruction. It, it, it's sad when you see the documentaries that actually show what goes on. It, it, it's terrible. It's awful. It's sin. It is the consequence of sin. The whole creation is subjected to futility, Paul tells us in Romans. So they're going to come after you. They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. I need to be okay with that. If that's how I serve the Lord, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, I love it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told King Nebuchadnezzar, our God can save us.
from your fire. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your idols and we will not worship. I don't get to tell the Lord how I'm, my life is supposed to end. I don't know how he's going to use that, how I'm going to be a witness to him or whatever else. I don't get to determine how long I get to stay here. None of that's under my control. Again, foot of the cross. That God who loves me so much that he died for me, well, what did he do? He got flogged till the skin on his back was falling off, and then he got nailed to a tree and left there to die the most horrible death ever, and then they stabbed him in the side after he was dead to make sure he was dead. The one who went through that for me, why would I be afraid of anything? He's got me. He's got me. And I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to press in closer to him. But many, and then many, will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And, and this fall away, the, the, the word here is the same as up here with a stray. It's the same as deceive. The word is scandalizo, scandal, scandal. The word scandal, we know that. But what a, the, the scandalizo, the, the, that thing, scandalon is the, ver, is the noun, it is the stick that holds the bait and is itself the thing that springs the trap. It entices you in. Look, little mouse, there's some cheese or peanut butter here on this little plate, and you can come and nibble on it. And then when you nibble on it, that thing is the thing itself that whack the the mouse gets gets killed by the trap. That is the picture. The scandalon is the bait and the trigger for the trap that results in death. And then many will scandalize, fall away, be deceived, be led astray, be destroyed, and betray one another and hate one another. There are two kinds of people in a crisis. There are the people who will stay calm. Their heart rate actually goes down a little bit. They stay calm. And they also, and that's not always the case. They may not feel calm. They appear calm. But here's the big thing. They do the right thing. You know what courage is? Courage isn't not having any fear. That... Courage is doing the thing that needs to be done without regard to the consequences. I'm going to remain faithful. What are they going to do to me? It doesn't matter. I'm going to remain faithful. There's that side of the picture, and then there's the other side that bites and devours itself and each other. And that's exactly what he says. And betray one another and hate one another. They turn on each other. Once you move away from the shepherd, you are in the dominion of the wolf, and it isn't pretty because he's not a nice guy. He's not a nice guy. Do you know why he came here? Let's go take a look. This is when Satan, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Satan gets kicked out of heaven. I'll put the, the thumbnail up on the screen right now. There it is. And I'll put the link in the description below to the video on Revelation that talks about this. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Deceiver of the whole world. You guess what that word is? Just guess. Guess what the word deceiver is? Scandalon. The scandalon is a participle, a verbal a noun, verbal noun. It's He's the deceiver. He is the scandal on. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. This, this, that's who he is. That's what he does because that's who he is. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Don't, don't miss the key words here. False prophets, very important. Many. 
many, that adjective, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Satan wants as many who work for him inside the church as possible. And and he uses the same temptations for them, money, popularity, the praise and adulation of men, success, power, Every pastor that you've ever heard of who went off the rails and went off the track, those five things I just mentioned played a part in it. They played a part in it. And sometimes I see that, you know, this pastor, that it's worth $40 million or $250 million. And my mind just pops. My mind just pops. Could you imagine Paul holding on to $40 million? Paul was always sending money to everybody else who needed it. It's a temptation. It's a trap. False prophets, Satan gets his people on the inside. Satan gets his people on the inside. And I have a simple rule of thumb. It's it's just mine. I don't, for me, I believe it. But this rule of thumb is this. No one gets to be someone really big and important in this world if you're not, if you don't have their, they, them, their stamp of approval. Just doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. That they will keep you down. They will keep you down. So beware. Beware. And lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased. Lawlessness, the law. In the Old Testament, the concept of the law was the whole teaching, the the teaching of God's truth, the Torah, the the teaching of God's truth. And, And you just take all of that and throw it away. Look out your window, and you can look out your window by turning on your TV. What do you see? What do you see? Is it as though all the teaching of God, the truth, that he imparts to us for our well-being because he wants us to be happy, content, safe, blessed, close to him, saved. It's all been thrown out the window. Boys or girls, girls or boys, there is no truth. There is no morality. It's and, and the degree to which we are in this downward spiral just blows my mind. I, I can't believe how fast it happens. But once you take the truth and throw it away, it is a downward spiral because there is no foundation. There is no foundation. And the truth of God, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, throw that away and you got nothing. And it's chaos. It's the plains of the Serengeti. It is the jungle and destruction and death and danger all around. That's what you get. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. In Revelation, in those first chapters where where Jesus is sending letters through John to the seven churches, he talks about that. He talks about that very thing, their love growing cold. It can happen, and it certainly happens. The more you focus on the world and not on the shepherd, guess what's going to happen? You start to think that stuff looks good because it does. Because right there in your heart is the sin that makes lust, greed, selfishness, self-promotion seem appealing. The deception lives within you. How do you keep it down? How do you keep it under control? Because it's not going away until the Lord Jesus takes you home. And that's got to be the best part about transitioning from here into eternity. All of that is gone. The burden of my own sin, forget the world and Satan and all of that, the sin I struggle with every moment of every day, because it's right here, gone. It's got to be Amazing. But we keep that sin under control. We smack it down and say, be quiet through the power of the Spirit and the Word 
and the shepherd to whom we are drawing closer and closer. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, we can go right to Revelation 2.10, where Jesus tells them that they're going to suffer and be thrown into prison. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's what Paul talks about in 2 Timothy, where there is laid up for me the, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but to all who long for his appearing. I long for it. We desire it. That's what we want as we draw. It's inevitable as you draw closer to him and his word, as you draw closer to him, as your faith grows, that relationship strengthens the desire for him to come and for all of this to end, whether it's just for me as an individual or the whole thing to be done. That is our heart's desire. But the one who endures, endures. What does what endure imply? What does it require? What does it require? Do I have to endure? You know, my, my, my grandchild comes over to visit and wants to sit on my lap and give me a hug and a kiss and, and play farm with her little toys down on the floor. When she's done and she goes home, and mom and dad take her home, do I say to my wife, wow, man, that was tough to endure. I didn't think I'd be able to endure that. No, that's pleasant. That's wonderful. That's awesome. I endure difficulty. I endure hardship. I endure spiritual warfare. I endure oppression, injustice, persecution, slander. Those are things that I endure, but the one who endures, it's tough. Jesus knows it's tough. That's why he wants to help. But enduring implies that there's difficulty to go through. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom, that term gospel, it simply is good news. Good news. Good news that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. Good news of life that he wants us to have, because even in the midst of enduring all this stuff, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Serving him, being faithful to him, it's what I was made to do. So even in the midst of enduring hardship, difficulty, persecution, oppression, in the midst of all that, I can have joy. I do have joy. The disciples in the book of Acts, beautiful example of this, they get beaten in chapter four, for healing a guy. And, and they left celebrating that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name, the name of Jesus. And then in Acts 14, I believe it's 1422, I'll pop the verse on the screen in editing. After Paul had been stoned, not, not stoned, stoned to death, rocks thrown at him until they thought he was dead. And they left. How bad do you think he got beat up? But he was still alive. And the others got him up and they, and they went to the next city and then the next city. And then they came back through and were preaching the gospel. And it says that, ah, we'll, we'll go pull it up. Because I'm now I've talked about it so much, I'm going to have a hard time. They came back through, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That is, I have, I've deemed that for myself. That is the most powerful sermon ever preached. You know why? Because he was standing there with scabbed over wounds, still, you know how bruises go from blue and purple to kind of that brownish yellow, head to toe. 
head to toe. And his message is, hey, it's hard. It's okay. It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Most powerful sermon ever preached. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony that the, 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 it's the word martyr is there in that, as a testimony, as a witness, a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed. Why are you here? Why hasn't he come back? What is he waiting for? Hmm. I think he tells us right here. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. We'll talk about the nations thing in a minute. And then the end will come. There is only reason, one reason that we are here, and it is to proclaim the gospel. And once it has been proclaimed to all nations, whatever that milestone is specifically, don't know, but it will be proclaimed as a testimony to all nations and then subsequent action, and then the end will come. If I were in Paul's day, I guess that what I'd be doing would be putting on my sandals and my toga and, and walking around and preaching the gospel. That's what I do here in this day and age. And, and if I were to go up the road and go to the Walmart and stand out there in the parking lot and be proclaiming the truth of the word of God, what would people think? They'd think I was a wackadoo, right? There, no one would listen to me. That's not how things happen nowadays. In the day, back in the day, the, the gospel, well, just news, people had conversations in the city square. Go to your town, your downtown, the, the town that we live near has a nice town square. Who's in it? Nobody. Maybe people at lunchtime passing through, going from the courthouse over to the burger place. It, culture was different. People stood in the town square they visited in the city gate. The, the leaders of the town sat and visited and talked. They conducted business. So you could go and talk and preach and proclaim, and people would listen. That's not how it happens now. Now, if you want to get the word out, if you want to try to proclaim the word to as many as possible, then what you got to do is learn how to make videos and build a web page and put things out on BitChute. And Gab, I was on YouTube. That's where I started. You know why I quit? Because they they didn't let my stuff get out to anybody. It, it wasn't going to happen. I kept working. Then I found these other, these other venues. But the reason I do things the way I do, it, it's tied in with this. I do things in two levels. I do two different things. If you go to my website, you'll see. Maybe I'll pop that up here. And, and I'm not doing this as self-promotion. I'm doing it, well, I guess it's, it's not really self-promotion. I want to get the word out. I want to have as many followers as possible, as many people listening as possible, because that helps me share the word, strengthen people's faith, and build them up. But I've got the Bible stuff that I do, but I also have the, the stuff that I'm looking at the things going on in the world. There's the 18-dimensional chess. Here's a video on the book, The Real Anthony Fauci. In these, do I talk about the faith? Yeah, some. What My goal in doing this is twofold. Number one, I want to inform you. Why? Because I don't want you to be deceived because these people out here, the Anthony Fauci's, the, they, they keep on deceiving us. This is about Pearl Harbor, remember Pearl Harbor. It's a video about how there's deception about false flags. It's all spiritual warfare. It's all spiritual warfare. So I do these videos along with the Bible videos to help you, to protect you so that you're informed and aware and that you won't be deceived. 
But it's also my hope that we get some cross pollination, that when people I, in the videos that I put out that that get the biggest hits, it's stuff like this. Graphene oxide, clear and present danger, frightening video, scary stuff. That's why I got the guy in the skull and the medical stuff. And there's graphene oxide and there's the vaccines. These videos get huge hits. It's my hope. I, I want people to know what's out there, what they're doing with this stuff. But I also, by putting this stuff out there and they listen to me there and they say, oh, well, this guy talks Bible stuff. Maybe I'll listen to that as well. So the, the, the twofold approach to the proclamation of the gospel and hoping that people don't get deceived, both believers and those who are not believers, it's all in the effort to preach the gospel to all nations because it's then that the end will come. I'm able, I, I, I haven't counted lately, but on my website, I've got hits, last time I checked, from like 80 different countries around the world, around the world. Just me, guy sitting here in Georgia doing videos, got hits on my website from 80 different countries, and it happens all the time, places I'd never be able to go and walk into their town square and, and talk to them. Let's talk about all nations. All nations. Every time you see nations, you have to go back to the meta narrative, a major meta narrative of the scriptures. And that is that the nations, the 70 nations, were assigned to the B'nai Elohim. And God said, I'm, and this is a Deuteronomy 32 thing, and I'm going to be doing a video on this soon. I talk about Michael Heiser all the time. I just want to do a simple video laying out this teaching comprehensively so that when I refer to it, I can say, hey, go watch this video and, and you can get up to speed on it. At the Tower of Babel, God assigned the 70 nations to spiritual beings, B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. They are created spiritual beings, and they went rogue. They went rogue, but he said, I'm going to pick a new nation. I will create a new nation, and that's where Abraham comes in, just one guy, and I will turn him into a great nation, and then I'm working my plan of salvation. The Messiah is going to come. And then once through that one nation, I've worked salvation, brought about the forgiveness of sins, the saving of souls. Then that one nation is going to take the word to all the others. That is where Pentecost, not just in the languages, it's Tower of Babel, the languages got divided. At Pentecost, they're able to speak different languages, and they were real languages, so that they could go out. The sign was, and the equipping was, go out and preach the gospel to all these different nations, and that's what Paul was all about. Where did Paul always want to go? He always said, I got to get to Spain. I got to get to Spain. I got to get to Spain. Why? Because in their worldview, Spain was the end of the world. Out beyond that, they didn't go. They never went. Spain, he wanted to get the gospel there. That was his goal, right? The proclamation of the word. Now, I've talked about what I do in being a part, a small part of that. And all I can do is what I can do. You know what? What I just said applies to you. You can do what you can do. What would the Lord have you do? How would the Lord use you? What might you be able to do that you haven't thought of? Maybe, maybe a prayerful conversation with the Lord, looking in his word, asking for wisdom, for perspective, for guidance, for direction, for courage. What can you do to spread the word? And I'm not saying that everybody needs to be a preacher of the gospel, not, not in the sense that a, a pastor is, a theologian is, no, but you. In your world, in your walk of life, what can you do? What can you do to further the kingdom, the proclamation of his word? Are, are you going to hold back and, and not share and proclaim the truth because you're afraid of what people will think of you? 
And how does that square with what our Lord says here in the picture of being close to the shepherd and wanting to draw others into the flock close to the shepherd? Didn't Jesus say, I have other sheep who are not of this sheep pen, and I must bring them in also. That's what we do. It's why we're still here. If you wonder, when is it going to end? Well, you can do something to bring it about. Share the word. Proclaim the word. Look for ways to do that. Support ministries that do that. Well, I want to thank you for listening. I pray It is my prayer daily that this teaching, the ministry that we do here is a blessing to you, that through it, you are being drawn closer to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I encourage you to go out and check out our other teachings. We've got 40-some videos on Exodus alone. We've got 43 videos on Revelation alone. We've got a lot of things out here. We've got all the other resources about the things going on in the world We've got stuff out here to help you, to equip you, to prepare you so that you are ready to decode the deception. Please give this video a thumbs up. It makes a difference. I invite you to subscribe. And when you subscribe, hey, hit that notification bell. That's the way you're made aware when we put out new content. As part of getting the word out to others, share this video with somebody else. Pop it on your Facebook page, Twitter, Gab, whatever you use. Put it out there so other people come in contact with it and have exposure to it. And do drop by and pay us a visit at decodingthedeception.com. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are Decoding the Deception. God bless and have a great day.